So huge, really much a lot of uh, cellulose yes. material. Yeah, cellulose, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So we already have the Okay, I think because uh, Dr. Meli will will uh, start uh, his uh, leadership training, national leadership training, in very very soon. So um, we would like to open this uh, webinar uh, with the opening remark from the uh, Dr. Yeni Meliana. Dr. Yeni Meliana, please. Okay, terima kasih atas honorable speaker. Dr. Anamalai from the University of Queensland. Good morning. Honorable speaker, Owen, Professor Narmandia from University of Sumatera Utara. Selamat pagi, Prof. Narman. Selamat pagi. Yeah. And then, Honorable speaker, Dr. Yapal Patel from Water Pacific, Singapore. Good morning, Dr. Yapal. And of course, uh, our uh, young bright researcher from our research center for chemistry, Dr. Asanasia Amanda Septepani from Indonesian Institute of Sciences, and distinguished moderator Dr. Sudet Hendrana, and of course, all distinguished participants. I see more than uh, 100 participants already join us right now. Good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. As the director of research center for chemistry, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, it is my pleasure to welcome you all in this webinar with the topic "Nanol Cellulas in Health Sector and the Potential Insights into COVID-19 Counter Measures." Uh, today, on 9 July 2020, I hope. You all doing well, particularly in the art and global situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, I see in Australia and Singapore, I felt that the pandemic has been declining, but in Indonesia, is still increasing. We still struggling with this COVID-19 right now. So, in this webinar, we will share for sure the latest and advanced progress of Nanocellular research presented by our honorable speaker, in particular to counter measure the COVID-19. I would like to express my grateful and highest appreciation to all the speakers for sharing your research and experience in this forum. Thank you to the organizers, Pasunit and Mr. Aris, and of course the all participants for attending this webinar. I hope this event will be the fruitful discussion that will multi party collaboration among of us. So after this webinar, we will continue our collaboration for the further research. Please feel free to discuss and enjoy this event. And then, so thank you. Best regard. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you very much for. Dr. Yeni Meliana for have, uh, giving the uh, opening remark and so also giving your effort permission for us to have this <laughs> webinar <laughs> with all your permission <laughs> yeah, yeah. and your contribution. We can all do this very good uh, webinar. Also, thank you very much. If uh, you want to have a join the National Leadership Program, please we 
we hope your success and and also baroka for for your uh, training, training national leadership training amin amin thank you thank very you. much thank you prof and dr satis Amanda, sukses ya. Izin saya meninggalkan. Oke, okay, I leave the meeting. Ya, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Dokter. Ibu, silakan. Ya, semua partisipan mohon maaf ini Dokter Meli, Dokter Yani Melina tidak bisa mengikuti kita karena beliau sedang akan mengikuti uh, uh, pelatihan kepemimpinan nasional. Jadi beliau harus harus mantengin terus lewat Zoom terus <laughs> dari waktu-waktu. <laughs> Terima kasih atas waktunya. Yeah. Ya, apa? Ya, apa izin sepuluh menit untuk membuka acara ini? Ya, terima kasih Pak. Ayo izin. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih. Ya, ya. Baik, um, kita mulai dari uh, sekarang ini dengan um, um, materi yang akan disampaikan oleh um, uh, para pemateri. Para pemateri itu ada ada empat pemateri itu yang pertama itu Dr. Amanda ya yang kedua itu akan dilanjutkan oleh Dr. Pratip dan yang yang selanjutnya akan uh, di diberikan oleh uh, uh, Dr. Profesor Saharman Gea beliau dari Universitas Sumatera Utara. Beliau juga sekarang ini menjabat Dekan 3, yang mengurusi kemahasiswaan, dan uh, uh, mempunyai mahasiswa doktor yang cukup banyak. Dan selanjutnya akan diisi oleh uh, uh, Profesor uh, Dr. Davil Pat, Daval Patel dari Business Development dari Waters Singapura. Um, kita mulai dengan we, we will start this uh, webinar from for the first speaker is yes uh, Dr. Atanasia Amanda Septavani. Yes, researcher in uh, research center for chemistry, Indonesian Institute of Sciences, location in uh, Pusat Serpong. It's a national science uh, national park in Serpong. Dr. Amanda is uh, he has a uh, uh, has graduated from chemical engineering Diponegoro University, and he has a PhD from the uh, the University of Queensland. He is working during this uh, uh, Queensland. He worked in AIBN, Australian Institute for Bioengineering and, and Nanotechnology, Australia, Brisbane, Australia. So he got uh, a lot of uh, um, rewards, L'Oreal Medal rewards, and also he have uh, some scholarship in in Cali uh, University in many time in uh, overseas, including in. Uh, Korea and in uh, United States. So I think we we will have a we will have a very good time uh, for from Dr. Amanda to give a, a lecture today. Please, Dr. Amanda, you can you may start this uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumit. Uh... Uh, first of all, uh, to begin my presentation, I would like to greet you, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming in our uh, webinar, and thank you also for the opportunity uh, given for me to share the current development of the nanocellulose, in particular derived from the uh, waste resources that actually has a potential application in biomedicals especially uh, we hope that this current webinar also open the opportunity and give an insight for all the audience considering the current condition of pandemic COVID-19. Okay, talking about the cellulose, cellulose by far is one of the most abundant biopolymer on earth 
especially uh, we can easily find the uh, these uh, resources not only in plant resources but also in non-plant resources for example spectoria tunicate and algae so if we can successfully turn the cellulose in micro scale into the nano scale we can exploit the properties of the cellulose itself into uh, several advantages first of all is the uh, these materials offering the high tensile properties in fact in fact that there are so many reported showing that the cellulose nanocrystal particularly uh, can exhibit the tensile properties even eight times stronger than the steel which is very valuable properties for the uh, mechanical reinforcement in a composite the second one is the presence of the uh, hydroxyl groups on the surface of the na nanocellulose can also give a, a benefit for the easy functionalization, especially for the cross-linking. For the cross-linking with the other chemicals, uh, both inorganic and organic uh, matter. The optic transparent of the nanocell itself also uh, offer a benefit that we can easily uh, incorporate this nanocellulose into various application it is because this optic transparent will not uh, interfere the color of the polymer host. And of course, this is, as we know, that is renewable, biodegradable, massively available, and at low loading, it also can uh, provide the improvements and significant impact on the final products, which is can also uh, maintaining the uh, light weight of the materials. Okay, talking about the structure of the nanocells, for example, the structure of the nanocells in the plant cell, when you see there is uh, consists of a thousand fibers that we can easily see by our eye. But then when it goes into the microfibrils, that every single fibers consists of the multiple microfibrils. And its microfibrils, we have uh, about uh, 5 to 50 nanometer diameters. And every each of the microfibrils, it also contain both order domain, which is crystalline domain, and also amorphous domain. And if we can apply uh, several uh, process such as chemical, mechanical, biologicals, we then can get and obtain the uh, structure, control structure nanocellulose, which are in the form of the cellulose nanocrystal. Uh, as well as the cellulose on the fiber as the domain of the as the dominant uh, form of the nanocells. Okay, as you can see in here, that depend upon the resources, the nanocells size and geometry will also uh, affect the um, uh, aspect ratio. For example, if you can see in here, I can divide it into two resources. First, the non plant which is for example tunicate, algae, and bacteria it uh, usually can generate the high aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio is the uh, ratio between the length to the cross section. Uh, meanwhile, for the plant resources such as cotton and wood, they will generate aspect ratio at a low aspect ratio between 20 to 50. So that uh, the aspect ratio basically is very play important role on the uh, properties of the final products. That's why it is quite uh, it's very important to explore the resources that can be used to obtain the nanocellulose. Our group uh, started to develop uh, the nanocellulose from the biomass resources. We have started from the waste resources. So why waste resources is so uh, interesting to be developed into the nanocellulose? We are trying to develop and improve the high uh, valuables of these such non-valuable resources into innovative materials. We also do hope that our uh, development can also address the challenge in the environment. So in this presentation, I would like to uh, explore more in details about the resources from the waste in the palm oil industry, as well as the waste from the uh, tofu industry. So the first one is the palm oil industry. 
So in as we know that Indonesia is the largest producer of the palm oil in the world. So in fact, the more palm oil, the more waste is produced every year. And in particular, oil palm empty fruit buns account for 25% of the fresh fruit bunch. And this particular waste is actually uh, have a potential valuable to be developed into the nanocellulose because it consists of quite a high compound of the cellulose account for about almost 40%. So how we can uh, turning this biomass into the nanocellulose? Basically, there are uh, three steps that we can do to transform these uh, waste resources into many various applications. So first of all, the first stages is the isolation of the cellulose. So these uh, stages aiming to do the cellulose purification, we're trying to isolate the cellulose from the lignin and the hemicellulose inside the biomass resources by doing the lignification as well as the bleaching. So in our research center for chemistry, we do hope the pretreatment at a large scale. Uh, the pilot plan with the capacity about 100 kilogram of the biomass. Uh, we also do have the, uh, as you can see in this uh, uh, slide, this is the uh, uh, band scales uh, with the capacity about 500 grams of the biomass. After the delignification, then we, we do the uh, bleaching process. Then once we can get the highly purified cellulose, then we can synthesize uh, into the nanocellulose, the most um, process that we adopt is by using the chemical acid hydrolysis as well as the mechanical treatment. We also can do the combination of the above mentioned process. So once we can get the nanocellulose, then we can further do the process uh, for various applications. So this is the result of the uh, treatment uh, of the biomass. We can see that uh, the uh, cellulose content is significantly increased the purity from 38% into the 84% after the subsequent process of the lignification and bleaching process. While for the lignin, it will reduce significantly for 37% to uh, below the 1%. So as you can see in here that the uh, per treatment morphology analysis, you can see that the distinctive characteristic, the change of the raw oil palm empty fruit buns based on the SEM into the microfibrils, into the individual microfibrils getting loose up from the bundles of the fibrils in the raw materials. So after we can get the uh, So after we can get the uh, microcellulose, then we can do the exit hydrolysis. So uh, the first row is the strong, uh, we're using the strong exit hydrolysis, while the second row, we are using the uh, mild exit hydrolysis. So based on this resources, we can see that the uh, strong acid hydrolysis is usually can produce, a, 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 for example, the root-like shape and needle-like shape of the exit uh, of the uh, morphology uh, nanocellulose, while for the mild exit hydroly hydrolysis produce uh, entangled and long fibers of the nanocellulose. Uh, it is also interesting to see that the strong acid hydrolysis for example, uh, with, the, with the use of the other resources such as the corn cob, even though we are using uh, strong acid hydrolysis, it will produce the long entangled uh, hydrolysis. So this result emphasizes that, uh, uh, not, uh, that the biomass resources really uh, play important uh, uh, parameters to, uh, to determine the morphology and characteristic of the oh, as well as the type of the exit and also the composition. So this is crystallinated studies. You see that the highly crystalline of the CNC is obtained from the exit, the strong exit hydrolysis compared to the mild acid hydrolysis. 
So we, we also do the uh, production of the nanocells via mechanical approach. Uh, we use the ultra thorax homogenization uh, at the high speed about 20 k RPM, and we can produce the uh, nanofibrils uh, structures. And uh, this actually is quite in interesting to see because this can give a potential uh, method to develop the cellulose nanofibers because first of all, it is uh, there will be no bit impurities compared to the other mechanical methods such as high energy bit milling. It also offer a lower energy required during the process, which is very uh, useful to reduce the cost of the production. So this is thermal stability of the nanocells from oil pump and input bunch. We can see the improvement of the thermal stability along the process. So uh, second process, uh, so, sorry, second resources uh, that uh, I'm going to explain is from tofu industry. So tofu is a very popular food in Indonesia. In fact, there are 84 tofu factories in Indonesia that mainly based on the home industry that require about 2.5 million tons of soybean. In fact, from this tofu industry, it will produce uh, both a solid waste as well as liquid waste. In the case for the solid waste, it actually already can uh, produce a various uh, co-products such as livestock feed, fertilizer, as well as the food product. However, for, for the case of the liquid waste from tofu industry, uh, there are still a challenge, in particularly this liquid waste contain uh, high BOD and COD that are quite dangerous for our environment. And if we uh, need to throw it away this liquid waste into the environment, it will be required intensive water treatment, which is very expensive. But the fact that this uh, liquid tofu waste is actually rich of the nutrient to grow up the bacteria that can produce the bacteria cells. So we're using the acetobacterium to produce the uh, nata de soya. Then after that, we do the subsequent uh, hydrolysis process to obtain the bacterial nanocells. So this is the morphological analysis of the bacteria cells. As you can see that uh, similar to the biomass plant resources that the strong acid hydrolysis will produce the uh, aspect ratio lower than the mild acid hydrolysis. Uh, yeah, similarly for the bacteria cells, uh, using the sulfuric acid hydrolysis, it will also con con can produce the higher crystallinity compared to the mild acid hydrolysis. So we have uh, exploring these two resources from the waste uh, based materials in our surrounding environment. But then now we are tr trying to uh, explore what is the application of those nanocellulose. So I've been uh, working in nanocellulose since uh, my PhD study in 2013. And once finished the, my PhD, I also continue to exploring the valuable potential of nanocellulose into various applications such as industrials, electronics, environment, renewable energy, and also the biomedicals. So in the case of the biomedical that I'm going to uh, explain more in details, uh, so let's have a look at the his uh, history of the nanocellulose in biomedical application. So based on the database of the uh, digital publication of the ProQuest and then Web of Science and PubMed, it can be seen that basically nanocellulose started to explore uh, at about 20, uh, 2006. Inter uh, interestingly, that the first paper uh, that exploring the nanocellulose is actually applied in the biomedical application, which was for the constructing tissue replacement. So since then, there are lots of studies to use nanocellulose in the biomedical application. So why nanocellulose is such so um, uh, attractive in the case of the biomedical application? There are several parameters and characteristics 
that is offered by the nanocellulose. First is the adsorption capacity and then the excellent strength and elasticity. Uh, using the nanocellulose with the controllable morphology also can help to control the properties of the final biomedical products, as well as the porous structure will help as well in the properties of the biomedical application and also the biocompatibility of the nanocellulose. So there are three types of the categories in the form of the nanocell that can be used in the application of nanocells. First, in the form of the gel, thin film, and also the paper. Uh, I'm going to explore in detail about the gel and thin film for this uh, presentation. So this is the, uh, the form uh, of the gel nanocells in the form of hydrogels. As you may uh, already familiar with about the hydrogel. So hydrogel is a three-dimensional polymeric matrix that actually uh, have unique properties. It can absorb 100 times larger than its original volume and swell without dissolving and rupturing the structure on morphology of the hydrogel. As you can see that if we want to use the hydrogels into the application of biomedical, there are three important parameters that need to be uh, fulfilled. First is the high, sorry, high absorption capacity. Minimum should be about 450 gram water per gram products. The second one is the compatibility. The compatibility uh, of the with the biomarker because uh, for the biomedical, usually we are introducing the uh, living biology into the system of the hydrogels. And the third one, the control release, which is very important that can be managed uh, by using the environmental stimuli. So, however, uh, there is uh, challenges uh, in developing hydrogels into biomedical application. The first one, the most important challenge is that the low mechanical properties. This really can give a, a problem, especially it can induce the early drug release before uh, reaching the target size. So to address this challenge, we can use nanocells that can enhance the mechanical properties. As you can see in, the, in this uh, slide, the nanocell, uh, nanocellulose hydrogel can be applied into a various application of biomedical, including drug delivery and then diagnostic separation, tissue engineering, and also 3D cell culture. So uh, the first one to produce the nanocellulose uh, hydrogels, uh, we did the collaboration with the Center of Pharmaceutical Medical Technology, BPPT. Uh, AMI helped us to investigate the, uh, especially the alginate nanocellulose. She was uh, my students from Wageningen University in Netherlands, and she did such a great job to finish to understanding the uh, effect of the nanocellulose, especially in the alginate nanocellulose uh, hydrogels. So as you can see in here, that the uh, nanocellulose, when we incorporate nanocellulose into the hydrogel system, you can see that nanocellulose can help the uh, helping to maintaining the integrity structure of the hydrogels. While without the nanocellulose, hydrogel may be shrinkage and the collapse structure can be obtained. And you can see in the mechanical properties that there is a significant enhancement of the mechanical properties up to 160%, which is quite impressive to see. And that's why it can help to give uh, optimum protein release. Because in this uh, study, we also introduced the stem cell conditioning medium uh, as the re regenerative uh, agent, especially to help in healing this chronic wound that can uh, help the growth of the cell and healing during the process. So uh, as you can see in here, that the presence of the no cells can uh, doubles the protein release into the systems. So the second uh, hydrogel production that we already explored is based on the starch 
this polymer. So we are using starch as the main backbone to substitute the monomer of the acrylic acid. Uh, we also uh, incorporate bacteria nanocellulose, both uh, from the sulfuric and phosphoric. And you see that the presence of the nanocellulose in the starch-based hydrogel, you can see that there, there is a significant improvement from 200 absorption capacity gram water per gram hydrogels into the doubles 500 absorption of water per gram hydrogels, which is when uh, you remember my previous slide that it uh, reads the, the uh, maximum, the optimum of the uh, potential drug delivery system. So the, this uh, system is also a well help in the water ret retention that uh, can retain up to 30 hours in the environment at about 60 degrees Celsius. So the third uh, method to develop the production of the hydrogels is also by using the, it is quite a uh, novel advanced technology by using the 3D printing, especially by using the digital, digital lab processing. We do the collaboration with the Politecnico di Torino, Italy, and based on the photopolymerization, we can just uh, input our photocurable polymeric solution. We can also incorporate nanocellulose into the uh, solution, and then by using layer by layer irradiating of the process using the UV light, then we can obtain and transform from the liquid of polymeric solution directly into the solid phase. So once the process finish in about uh, several minutes, we can obtain a precise and a complex 3D printing object of the hydrogel nanocellulose. So when we incorporate the nanocellulose into this uh, hydrogels, 3D printed hydrogels, as you can see, we did some uh, simple mechanical compression test by using the full compression test, the system without the CNC, you can see that the hydrogel will be scrambled up into a pieces. While when we incorporate the nanocellulose, the nanocellulose can, after the compression, fully compression test, it can maintaining the structural integrity after the compression test. And you can see the rheology properties that it will also induce a double uh, storage modulus after, uh, when we introduce the nanocellulose. So currently there, there is a master students in Politecnico de Torino that will continue our such, uh, interesting uh, results. So uh, let me also share about the electro spoon nanocellulose. There, as we know that electronic spinning, electro spinning is the established technique that we can use the polymer solution and using the strong electric field to produce the nano size fiber. Uh, very recently, it is reported that we can include the living biology directly into the polymer solution. And then when we, uh, and then after the process, we can get the electro spoon nanofiber that by, uh, by incorporating with such uh, living biology, then it can be applied into a various bio biomedical application, such as biosensing and biocatalyst, protective materials, therapy, and also tissue engineering. So this is uh, our initial research result that is in collaboration with the Center for Physics in Lippi uh, with the Dr. Andri. And we can see in here that the introduction of the cells of nanocrystals significantly changed the morphology of the polymer into a very small and uniform nano size effect. This is definitely can enhance the super uh, high surface area as well as improve the mechanical properties that is really benefit in the case of the uh, biological application. So uh, to sum up my uh, presentation, I would like also give some further uh, 
uh, perspective of the use nano cells in the biomedical application. In particular, uh, our current condition about the infection disease, even for the old infections such as dengue, malaria, and now is a novel COVID-19 are still a threat for our society. So it is very important to develop surveillance systems by using nanotechnology, tech nanotechnology that is crucial for disease detection as well as the control of the society health. So um, the fundamental of the nanomaterials, especially based on nanocellulose, has been uh, investigated not only, I believe, uh, from our group, but also uh, several and um, I think many group now developing nanocellulose that we ha have developed that the nanocellulose can also produce a very high adsorption capacity nano enable system biocompatibility with the excellent mechanical properties. So by using these excellent nanomaterials properties, as well as the collaboration of the multidisciplinary fields in nanoscience, biochemistry, physics, as well as virology, uh, I'm trying to give a future uh, perspective that for example, with the 3D nanocells, it can really develop the excellent drug delivery that can be helped for the developing the control drug delivery release for the process of the countermeasure in the various uh, infection disease. Uh, the second one is diagnostic. So the contemporary diagnostic, for example, we, you all, we usually use the paper-based uh, cellulose that actually this paper-based cellulose is uh, uh, always overlooked. The people always trying to develop the bioreceptor such as the protein, antibody strains, as well as the nano gold or nanoparticles for giving the uh, measurable signals in the detection. But actually the best material itself is play important roles in the mechanism of the integrity between the bioreceptor as well as the biotransducer that is later on can give a significant uh, accuracy on the diagnosis. So by changing the current contemporary uh, cellulose paper into the 3D nanocellulose network, it is uh, expected to give a more accurate and good mechanism to retain the uh, biomolecules process that is attached into the uh, 3D nanocells network and will give the accuracy and sensitivity even at a low antibody detection. Uh, also for the case of the uh, fibers itself, it will also give a benefit, particularly for the protective materials, for masks for example, and also for healing the damaged tissue cells in our body uh, by incorporating the tissue engineering. So to end my presentation, uh, I would like to thank you all of the members, particularly that helping so much in developing our projects. For Dr. Sondari, for uh, the Center for Biomaterials that currently focus on the nanocellular hydrogel, especially for drug delivery, Julian Sampora that focus on the nanopaper and membrane, and also Dian Burhani, uh, that she is now focused on the mechanism of the absorption and absorption of the nanocells, for, uh, in particular for the water remediation. The dispersion and the stability of the nanocells also is such an important parameter on developing the high properties of the nanocomposite that will be held and handled by Milati Septianti. Uh, for the case of the pretreatment biomass, Ian Irawan also very helpful. In particular, we are trying to develop the commercial or large scale of the cellulose by using our pilot plan that will be helpful for various reinforcing filler. And we also do have a, Ye a Yeni and Gita that are really helpful in establishing the technical uh, process during our lab process. So I would like also thank you for the collaborators within Indonesia from BPPT, the Center for Physics, the Center for Electronics and Telecommunication in LIPI, uh, for the Dr. Nurjati from Aikman, and also Professor Basuki from USU, 
as well as Dr. Ani Handayati from ET. The internal collaboration also really give a significant development on our uh, nanocell development, which is from the Politecnico di Torino, as well as from the University of Queensland, of course, from as my previous uh, PhD uh, university, and also uh, Professor Myung Han from South Korea and Dr. Tara Schiller from the University of Warwick. So to end this presentation, I believe that every known start with an I known. And this I known is actually a reflection of this insight. And I do hope that our presentation will also give you the insight for our audience to develop together the nanocellulose to be the cutting edge technology in the biomedical application. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Amanda for the very energizing lecture. I know that your energies never stop. <laughs> it's very inspiring. It's very, very good one. So we can, if you have any question, you can deliver, you can uh, send your uh, question to Q&A uh, uh, Q uh, section here in the below. So, um, the question and answer section will be uh, carried out in the end of this uh, this uh, the presentation after all the presentation give the uh, lecture. So thank you very much, Dr. Amanda. Then you are going to the second second lecture from the University of Queensland. Uh, he is uh, Dr. Pati Kumar Anna Malai. He is a uh, um, he got the uh, student of, uh, he got the PhD from the chemistry from the University of Pune, India. And he worked for, especially on hydrophobic membrane um, before he joined in the University of Montpellier to France before he joined in IBN. So, um, because the time is, uh, we have only short time, so I, I have a give a time for Dr. Pati to give a, a lecture. Dr. Pati, please. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Professor Saram and Sunit and Amanda for giving me an opportunity to talk about our work. And uh, I start with uh, uh, acknowledging the Australian land owners, uh, traditional owners and custodianship for the land and which we meet today and, my, and pay my respect to their ancestors and descendants. So uh, today my talk is on the nanocellulose, how we can use the uh, nanocellulose as a sustainable functional additive, mainly for the protective materials. Um, so, so the Australia, I think you you may have an idea about Australia. So it's a it's a end of the down under in the southern hemisphere, and I I call it actually it's a best laboratory of the nature, where we have a different landscape extreme conditions and you know various creatures and our university is in the state of Queensland and in the east of the Queensland state where we have you know uh, shining sun and beaches both in the city and the um, in the coastal areas and our university it's University of Queensland is next to the Brisbane River and that's where uh, Amanda has got us at PhD. Um, so, so we are based in the uh, uh, Australian Institute for Bioengineering Nanotechnology where we want to solve uh, the society's problems through mainly sustainable materials and a healthy living and translation success. And where we focus on uh, five uh, different areas on the one on this uh, stem cell and the precision engineering and advanced materials. So that's my uh, 
uh, area and agriculture nanotechnology where we talk you know where we um, solve the problems in the uh, agriculture mainly plants and advanced bio manufacturing so we try to use bio processing for manufacturing different materials and there are some um, examples already like we have developed need needle free vaccine for uh, delivery um, and currently we are also part of the a coalition for epidemic prepa uh, preparedness innovations and where we are looking at developing vaccine so it's it's more bio uh, uh, material area um, and our group is the polymer and nanomaterials group in the uh, institute of bunging nanotechnology where we have uh, you know the infrastructure and facilities for making nanomaterials uh, in starting from gram scale to 500 five kilo a day uh, where we have a different range of uh, you know, mechanical processing equipments and polymer processing equipments like uh, uh, extrusion injection molding and uh, for the testing um, and also the mechanical property testing for soft materials or you know construction materials where, where we you know uh, care about the mechanical properties and thermal insulation for the building materials and all. so the, this is our group and mainly my focus in in this um, you know this area is about the uh, 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 addressing sustainability so sustainability is nothing but this uh, you know the, the sustainable development that meets the present generation needs and also without you know without compromising the ability of next generation so that adds through with the three main uh, pillars which is environment economy and air society and from material point of view so we want to make uh, accessible materials I mean it's not just you know restricted to one country or, you know one rich community or something we want to make accessible products for uh, you know all of them and and so that will that will be possible by when we do cost effective manufacturing and now we have to worry about the environment as well so we can we try to you know uh, shift from the dependence on petroleum resources to more on the uh, biomaterials more renewable materials and also like uh, to to talk about the circular economy so we want to uh, use the uh renewable material because the renewable material can be you know circulated on the same loop and so potentially so so that i think in in last uh, uh 40 years or something like we have developed the, the many process from the renewable material but they are not still yet in the applications the main issue is then they they are not cost effective the process is not really uh you know environmentally friendly or or uh, um, you know non toxic okay so we in our group we try to care about the cleaner greener processing and try to use uh, less material low energy consumption and if possible recycle so with no or less environmental impact and mo more importantly the sustainability here is more on the performance improvement rather than because we need better service life of any material okay so to to improve its sustainability or to um to reduce the you know material consumption or resource consumption so we want to uh, improve the performance of the from materials so so this is the way and it's not only you know uh, it's not only for that so um, uh, we also have to worry about the there is a sustainable development goals by that the world wide we have to achieve by 2030 and um, our research has to address you know the how we develop uh, these materials to to address this uh, sdgs okay and today i'm going to talk about the um, little bit about the protective materials which comes under you know is so addressing the good health and well being and clean up uh, clean water and sanitation and industry innovation and infrastructure 
So, and all, so you can see that that's 11, the, sorry, 17. So it's, these can be achieved more by more partnerships, okay? So they, they, we need to develop that partnerships as well around the world to, to address this uh, sustainable development goals. So you have heard about uh, nanocellulose from Manda. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just say that the, the molecular structure of cellulose, actually it's a linear molecule and it has a hydroxyl group that, you know, provides hydrogen bonding to make really rigid crystals when we want to have a rigid nanocellulose crystals. And that they are embedded in different polymers like hemicellulose and lignin. And they constitute actually the building block for any plant. So if you deconstruct back to nanoscale, we can exploit this, you know, that uh, hierarchical rigid nanocellular structure and also the mechanical properties if you want to uh, use them as uh, nanofiller. And it is available not only in the wood, but there are many other uh, non-wood sources. You can see that wide range of sources. And I'll briefly explain about different types of nanocellulose, like where we can actually, we can take the, any uh, nanocellulose, the cellulose source, we can make all by treating with, you know, the sodium hydroxide or uh, other pulping treatments, you get this, you know, white color pulp. And then you can do a bit of expensive treatments like acid hydrolysis or oxidation to get really, you know, that rod-like nanocrystals. Or we can avoid these chemicals, so go for mechanical treatment. So you can do a shear treatments. So mild mechanical treatments will give you, uh, you know, the microfibers, which will have, you know, like 60 nanometer, or 100 nanometer thick nanofibers. But you can also do a bit of uh, chemical oxidation or other treatments and go um, further on the mechanical treatment, you can do make really, really thin nanofibers, like one to three nanometers or 10 nanometers. Okay, so these are the uh, three different um, types of nanofibers you can make from top-down approaches. There is also the bottom-up approaches where you start from you know, small molecules. And so you can use the you know, sugars and waste carbon source as a uh, for making bacterial cellulose, or you can dissolve uh, the cellulose polymers and electrospin it, really you know, get really thin nanofibers. So these are the different uh, type of nanocellulose. And, and as Manda mentioned, it's not only about the, you know, the uh, mechanical filler. So it's about the surface chemistry because of the hydroxyl group that offers the many chemistry that you can do, like silylation or oxidation or uh, phosphorylation. So the, the, these functionalities are important when you want to really make, you know, some other functions, okay? Um, and there is a demand uh, growing for this particular nanocellulose material. And it's, it's, it's going to be used heavily in different applications as well as additive. So today I'm going to talk about one of the biomass that is endemic to uh, Australia, you know, which is the spinifex grass. So this grass actually grows in the uh, uh, north part of Australia, which covers one third of the land. Um, and it grows like, you know, this circular hummocks, okay? And it, 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 um, it doesn't need much water. Okay, you don't put water for this, like you grow for any, uh, you know, uh, cotton or flax or, or wood. So this uh, grows in the desert. So, okay. And we, this uh, grass was heavily used by uh, Australian Aboriginals for uh, you know, several years. Um, and this, this particular grass has grown, I mean, evolved over 15 million years, okay? So it's, it, it's a, it has evolved to survive in this, you know, extreme condition. So um, 
you can imagine of uh, 54 degrees Celsius in the in the desert. So this can survive, and even in the desert for a few years, so it can resurrect and uh, it it can grow. So, so that it's a kind of, that kind of a, a source, and it go actually um, the root grows I mean grows well in, in a deeper in the mud. So it's, it's it, it can survive in extreme conditions. As I mentioned, it has been used very heavily by um, aboriginals for different um, applications like making hut or resin materials. And until I think in 2008, it was not explored in terms of material science. So we had a PhD student and she looked into you know, uh, um, for this biomass. And we tried to make, because I, I come from a nanocellulose background, and we try to make a nanocellulose uh, in the same way that we can make from other sources. And you can take gas, wash, grind, make a powder, and treat with sodium hydroxide treatment, and may bleach it. So for making that, I mentioned the three types of nanofibers. When you want to make really thinner, so you have to do some chemical modifications or enzymatic treatments. So for this source, you don't need to do that. So you can just skip the any chemical treatment, which reduces the cost and everything. And also for, you can see that the, 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 this requires really mild chemicals uh, for this, and you can go to uh, make really nice out of this. Okay, in, in some cases, you don't need to really even bleach it. Like you can leave the uh, lignin or hemicellulose within the nanofibers. And, and if when you compare with other sources, I mean, um, other um, the development in the nanocellulose, uh, actually this compares the length and uh, um, the thickness ratio. So in this ratio, so it's, you can see the spin effect stays on the top where we can make really long and thin fiber and with really reduced you know, uh, environmental impact and cost. Because we don't need use much of oxidizing chemical to get this kind of thinner nanofibers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like other do. Okay. And the uniqueness with the non-wood, any non-wood cellulose actually is the we can tune this composition, like you know, the lignin and hemicellulose. You can see here the Hemicellulose composition has been tuned, and also the lignin one. It depends on you know how we treat and how much concentration of chemicals that we use. So we can actually tune this composition because we need some of this. You know the lignin is more aromatic polymer, which if that is coated on the surface, actually that provides more hydrophobicity. Um, or, or you can tune that hydrophilicity of nanofibers. Okay, so that's the uniqueness of any um, non-wood uh, nanofibers. So, so we took, you know, the, the, you know, the, the cost effectiveness and the, you know, uniqueness in terms of properties made us to go for, you know, further development activities. So we made agreement with the um, Aboriginal industry called Dublin Aboriginal Corporation in Australia. And we made an agreement that for the benefit sharing from, for any commercial prospectus from this nanocellulose. And our uh, both federal government and the state government is supporting uh, our research to scale up uh, for this uh, production of nanocellulose from particularly from this nanocellulose, the spinifex. And we are fully operational from uh, 2018. And so today I'm going to talk about how these any these nanocellulose can be used in different protective materials. So, so not it's for both you know personal protection and you know the food materials and other material production. So you can see here the in you know you know if you want to protect from uh, you know the the maybe chemical contamination and bacteria and all other things. So you need uh, protective materials that are made 
from you know, different polymers because we need barrier properties. We need uh, tensile properties uh, or mechanical properties that are you know, suitable for uh, our hand and operations. Okay, so they they are made with different polymers like uh, natural rubber and natural rubber, or polyurethane rubber, even for the shoes and, and also we need polyurethanes. And for textiles, we need uh, nylon. And now recently, more activity is going on on the uh, bioplastic, which is polylactic acid, and even other biodegradable polymer like a polybutylene succinate. And th these are the you know the more uh, biodegradable polymer and biopolymer, and the so these are the new polymers that are explored, but they may not really you know satisfy the industry requirements for this kind of applications. So we so we we can use these um, you know uh, nanocellulose uh, to improve their properties. So an, another application is on the packaging as well. So first example I'm talking about is the natural rubber latex. So where we can make uh, you know the gloves. So for the properties for gloves actually is like you need really thin material. You know, like you don't want to make really thicker gloves or something. So you want to make thin, but that should have a strength, okay? And also like flexibility that you can really wear and uh, you know that uh, and good touch, good feeling. So you, you, you want really softness in this material. So when, so you can't really, uh, you know, like uh, the natural uh, rubber, so you can make by chemical cross-linking, you know, like you can make it, like, but you don't want, the, you don't want to make heavy chemical cross-linking and not thicker material. So you can use nanomaterials, unlike other inorganics. So this nanocellulose would be better because it's, thinner and it's more, more sustainable and we can use that. So we explore different types of nanocellulose with, you know, more bleached, you know, transparent uh, nanocellulose and the lignin containing or hemicellulose containing nanocellulose. And we also treat a bit of surface chemistry with, with the uh, choline chloride and the urea. So there we can get some different uh, surface chemistry, and we also compared with this uh, nanofiber based on wood. Okay, so we we made this different material, so we we could achieve really good improvement when we have a bit of surface modification with the choline chloride, and and not removing lignin. Okay, and the, the blue one with the unbleached nanofiber, so we could increase the strength. Okay, you can see that it's the tensile curve. So where you can see improvement in the increase in this tensile strength, but we did not, you know, stiffen this material. But okay, so we, we want that flexibility. So which is, so you shouldn't see the increase over here. If, if you see increase in this region, that means you are stiffening the material. Okay, so you, so you, you don't want to do that. So we, you just want to increase this strength okay so which we could achieve by this you know, long and thin flexible nanofibers okay and so in compare with the other properties we, we can see that the it is achieved really at low volume percentage of uh, cellulose you can see that black line and green line so it's a uh, bit within 0.5 percent loading levels and we, we can also see the toughness, which is the energy that is required to break this material is also increased from the control. So within you know, 0.5 percentage of nanocellulose. The other example I'm gonna show is the uh, thermoplastic polyurethane. Um, so thermoplastic polyurethane is, you can actually melt process. So unlike our uh, natural rubber, it's uh, latex. And here it's you know, the thermoplastic polythene is you can do melt processing, which is industrial process. Okay, you have to align your process to that industry that can adapt. So you can make um, a different range of materials, like stronger to soft material, and also like harder and stiffer material, like you know, uh, ski boots or something like that. They can make 
just from the uh, even thermoplastic polyurethane. But what we have to do for doing, you know, changing this is you have to change the co-monomer ratios. Okay, it's a chemical. It's a more, you know, you have to change the um, chemical ratios, uh, isocyanate and other things. Okay, so to avoid such chemical, you know, uh, modifications, we can add nanocellulose to increase that strength. So one. The immediate process actually is the, you know, the scalable processing is the extrusion. And we had a student from Malaysia, uh, she came here and she tested, you know, different nanocellulose that are coming from acid hydrolysis and the mechanical treatment and other. So we could see that it is when you process directly drying the material and putting into polymer, we could see that degradation of charring. Okay. So she took the route of, you know, dispersing the nanocellulose into polyol, into water, and then drying it. And then, okay, the, then she extruded that material into really, you know, a big extruder. And we could see the improvement in tensile strength. For elastomers, the tensile strength improvement is really important. So we, she could improve up to you know, 43% of the tensile strength in and within 0.5 percent of the loading of the nanocellulose. And this particular uh, type of nanocellulose actually provides the resiliency. I mean, uh, what it means is like when you are, you know, doing multiple uh, cycle of stretching and leaving it, and so your material should not become stiffer, okay? and it should not become really softer as well. So it needs to maintain its, um, you know, the elasticity and resilient properties. So you can see that the, uh, when we have a you know, TP, uh, thermoplastic control, it's almost closer. You know, you, they, we are getting the resilient properties, okay? With the 0.5 percent nanocellulose. The other uh, protective material, I can say that it's a uh, nylon based materials. So when we added nanocellulose in Spinifex nanocellulose here in, in the uh, nylon, uh, which is polyamide based. So you can see this is the control one. Okay. So when you add nanocellulose, you can increase the strength, the yield strength, and also the ultimate strength and without decreasing its elongation. Okay. So this is the elongation. When you add, you know, other type of nanocellulose, something like wood nanofiber, you can see that it doesn't increase the properties also, and it actually decreases the elongation. So you are losing the, you know, the uh, the flexibility and, and the elongation of your your uh, uh, nylon. So which nylon is mostly used in the textile materials. Okay, so the we need uh, stronger and tougher. Um, textile material. Okay, so this is another example. And I'm going to show just the preliminary work that I'm currently doing on the packaging material. So we took the so gum, which is another source of Australia. Uh, uh, so you can have a, a sore gum, which is non wood, and we can make nanofiber in the same way we do for. Uh, we took the starch, which is another biopolymer, renewable polymer. We can make packaging materials out of it, but it doesn't you know, satisfy the properties that we need. Okay. And also you know, the, the barrier properties. So we, we started this work very recently. Um, so you can, you can mix the you know, nanocellulose, cast the films, and test their properties. So here we can see as a function of nanocellulose. So we can see the improvement in um, tensile strength, you know, with, with the 0.25% of nanofiber. And also it, it retains that elongation, which is you know, the, the flexibility of your material. It, it retains the flexibility, uh, but it, it also improves the tensile strength of the material. But, it's an ongoing work. We still have to optimize this system 
to in, improve further. And uh, our initial um, testing on the actual barrier property, because we are worried about the barrier properties, um, you know, gas barrier, moisture barrier, for the packaging material. Um, so we did a um, uh, water absorption study. So we can see that, okay, we can see this. Uh, water absorption increases with the time. Uh, it actually, you know, it, it gives really high water absorption. When, but when you add a little bit of polyvinyl alcohol and nanocellulose, so we could really reduce it. So there is a slight reduction in the water absorption when you add nanocellulose. Okay. So more more importantly, the so we calculate the diffusion coefficient. Which is the you know the moisture transport within the material, so we we can know how uh, you know the how fast are all um, uh, the water is transported from the surface to in, inside material. So that's calculated by the D, so diffusion coefficient. When, so the, these two are two materials. First two materials are with the starch and you know glycerol and polyvinyl alcohol, where we see high. D, and when we added 0.25 percentage of nanocellulose, we could reduce that. Okay, so this, so this, you know, this indicates that the you know, nanocellulose can uh, improve the barrier properties or reduce the you know, uh, water molecule transport through the, its film. Okay, uh, it's ongoing work, and these are some other examples where around the world where. They try to use nanocellulose or uh, cellulose process. So here it is in the next to the river. It's a Queensland University of uh, Technology. They try to use the nanocellulose as a as a mask material, you know, to reduce that virus transport. And the other uh, example is from the University of British Columbia. They try to make really the microfiber based. Uh, in a mask material that's cover material and also the you know the nanofiber on the uh, on the mask so they, these are you know ongoing developments around the world in the nanocellulose so I, i'd like to sum, summarize that the nanocellulose itself is a really versatile functional material right? because it's, it's chemistry because it's a you know wide range of sources wide range of process we can you know apply so it's a versatile material and Spinifex is endemic to Australia, and they have a unique pro, uh, properties and composition and, and other things. Um, and they can be used really at low volume to improve the properties, I mean, mainly mechanical and barrier properties of this. And there are some other challenges, as um, Amanda mentioned, that you know, there, are, there are unknown, but you also want to you know, so that create, gives you uh, opportunities. So we have challenges, especially when you consider about the Australia, which is not uh, connected by land transport. Uh, so we um, we have to you know, face that challenge uh, in transporting materials, and that creates actually the new opportunities. So we are looking into really uh, uh, applications that where we can use. Um, nanocellulose in water you know like uh, because you can't uh, transport nanocellulose around the world with water so it's where you know if you want to use high volume applications so we want to reduce that um, transport so we are looking for more applications in water and more innovative ways and also we are looking for more uh, collaborations around the country and I thank all of you for your attention. And here are the, our um, group members. I thank them and our uh, support from both the state and uh, government and our budget partner. Thank you for your kind attention. Dr. Pratip, thank you very much for this uh, your very good and inspiring the presentation. I think I I don't want to make a summary of your of your um, 
presentation because that's a lot of thing knowledge that the very very heavy knowledge in, in terms of the uh, nanocellulose and cellulose nanocrystalline and, and and thank you so, yeah so if some uh, one uh, attendee want to have some discussion with uh, uh, Dr. Prati, please contact his, his uh, email address. So I think Dr. Prati will be happy to have some discussion with the attendee. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Prati, for your words. Thank you. We will have a question and session after all the participants have presented his uh, lecture. Yeah. Well, we also have here the uh, uh, attendee from Nepal, Dr. Professor Rameswar Adhikari and also Professor Associate Professor Jyoti from Tribunal University. Yes, uh, he, they are uh, very also very have uh, heavy on cellulose material. So welcome from for Professor Adhikari and Professor Associate Professor Jyoti. And uh, I hope that the uh, all the participants will will. Um, um, we'll uh, give uh, a, uh, hang on, yeah, so I hope, I hope you have some, uh, fill this form for untuk kehadirannya dan juga untuk evaluasi, nanti, uh, dan kita juga akan mem mempunyai, mem memiliki have uh, tiga door prize untuk tiga penanya yang terpilih dan kami harapkan dan presentasi ini uh, door prize ini di uh, disponsori oleh uh, Chrome Tech Indo yang akan uh, uh, yang akan memberikan pembicaraan pada uh, sesi keempat uh, selanjutnya uh, pembicaraan selanjutnya ya yeah, the next speaker is uh, Profesor Dr. Saharmanga is a lecturer in University of Sumatra Utara, Sumatra University, uh, Universitas Sumatra Utara. So his lecture will be bacterial cellulose in a medical application and its potential in COVID-19 countermeasures. Saharmanga is a uh, he got the uh, uh, he graduated from UK and now he is a uh, got a lot of the student and PhD uh, relating to uh, cellulose. Professor Gia, please. Professor Gia, please, you can. Uh, thank you so much, Pak Sunit. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, selamat pagi untuk kita semua. Salam sejahtera. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be a, a speaker for this uh, seminar, webinar. And then uh, actually, Two of uh, keynote speakers have already talked a lot about cellulose, Dr. Amanda and Dr. Kumar before me. And they explain a lot about cellulose, even for bacterial cellulose as well. So I try to uh, present a very short uh, uh, talk actually about uh, the potential of bacterial cellulose in a biomedical application. And then, uh, especially for potential in COVID countermeasures. Uh, Dr. Ambat, Dr. Amanda talked about uh, cellulose produced from uh, plants here. Yeah. yeah, however, refining of plant cellulose uh, typically involves harsh, uh, aggressive, Processing to remove non cellulose materials so like uh, lignin and hemicellulose. So, uh, try to find out another resource of cellulose 
which no chemical or mechanical refining necessary is available is like bactericin dose. So we see uh, has a very, very unique properties is like high water holding capacity, high carcinogenity, high tensile strength and fine web like networks like this. Very fine networks compared to uh, plant cellulose in micro size uh, plant cellulose. So we have already uh, produced uh, bacterial cellulose for a couple of things. Uh, by using agar as media. And then uh, we produce like bacteria colony as well. This is the way actually for us uh, to testing whether the acetobacter selenium has undergone mutation or not. Yeah, it's like this. Yeah, yeah mostly the acetobacter selenium which has undergone mutation, exhibits a rough colony. Yeah. And they, they spread from their colony, from the flocks. So, so normally uh, we don't use that anymore because it has already uh, undergone mutation. And then that's the way as well to keep our uh, bacteria for even for two, week, two years, yeah under minus uh, 17 degrees Celsius. So uh, when uh, my friend from uh, Spain asked me uh, for starter of bacterial cellulose, I sent her just one uh, colony of this and then easily for her to grow uh, in Spain. Yeah, we know that until today, we have already, uh, we, we already visit now about the production of uh, commercially available of bacterial cellulose. Yeah, it's like biofuel, it's like wound dressing. Yeah, so many things, even so many patterns we've got here. Yeah, for artificial durameters, artificial blood vessel, skin, tissue repair, bone dressing material. So I think especially in Indonesia, we produce a lot of bacterial cellulose, uh, we call as a uh, nata de coco. So uh, we have again, a very good alternative source of uh, cellulose. Yeah, yeah so many. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why we use a lot of bacterial cellulose? We see, yeah, because at least uh, five, uh, uh, six of uh, characters uh, of bacterial cellulose first biocompatible either in vitro or in FIFO is very good. Yeah, if we use is like uh, bone dressing, scalp folding, or uh, other uh, medical applications, yeah, very, very good. And then 3D fiber structures, where it's like here. Yeah. And then uh, we can uh, <clears throat> we can prepare as drug release uh, controlling and then pure cellulose, there's no lignin anymore. There's no other uh, organic uh, waste inside. Yeah, nearly 100% cellulose and then non-toxic materials. So that's the reason why uh, nata de coco we consume as a, uh, yeah, as a snack in Indonesia. It's not only Indonesia, even in Japan. I, I saw that uh, in Japan, in Europe, in America, yeah, even in Philippines. And then also uh, BC has a very high water binding capacity. So that's the reason why uh, very good to use as a, a media for uh, uh, one dressing. Yeah. Until today, yeah. Bacterial cellulose has already used as a durameter replacement 
for dental material as well. They use, uh, they use as a filler yeah. for artificial cornea for our eyes, for scaffold tissue engineering for stem cell, and then even for uh, diagnosis sensor. Yeah, so uh, we can prepare is like uh, is bioimaging from bacteria cellulose. Yeah, for drug delivery and then for wound dressing. Yeah, so today. I'm gonna talk specially for wound dressing. Yeah. After cellulose, yeah, as I told before, normally uh, we culture it by using a media, HS media, yeah, based on the glucose media, yeah. And then we use a coconut water as a, a, a source of uh, carbon. And sometimes uh, some of researchers in the world, they use another source of uh, fermented general waste. Yeah. And then until today, yeah, we can produce, we can culture by a kind of technique like static technique agitation technique or bioreactors. Yeah. Especially in my lab, in my laboratory in Medan, in Sumatra Utara, uh, we use static method or and agitation method, depend on uh, uh, the, 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 the end of the use of our product. Yeah, it's like uh, agitated BC like this, and then for static BC like this. Yeah. And then uh, when we, use bacteria cellulose as a uh, bone dressing. Yeah, like what we do in Medan, we use uh, andaliman. Yeah, andaliman. Uh, uh, what is it? Wait, wait a minute. Yeah, Xanthocillum acanthopodium, the kind of fruit in Indonesia. Yeah, uh, the spicy a bit, uh, the, the flavor a bit spicy and uh, commonly used to eliminate, to eliminate the small of raw fish and meat. Yeah, it's normally in Medan around uh, Tapanuli area, they use it. Yeah, and then uh, this Andaliman, uh, located at altitude about 100,000 meters above sea level with a temperature about 15 to 80 degree. Yeah. Yeah, the shape of the fruit is like green pepper, but it's green color turn black when it dries. Yeah. So we put that inside. So uh, we use uh, we put five grams, four grams, three grams, one gram, and then we got that the optimization uh, performance of uh, andaliman, yeah, when we put three grams inside. Yeah. yeah. This is uh, the cheese hand strong media. And then we inoculate acetobacter psyllium inside. Yeah, we inoculate for normally for eight days. Yeah, to get it's like uh, this uh, uh, follow tip BC in a static method. This is an purified BC, and then we purify it. Yeah, by uh, using sodium hydroxide. And then uh, for uh, one night, yeah, for overnight, and then we, we're gonna have purified BC like this. Yeah. yeah. To prepare wound dressing, we use hydrogen and also uh, collagen. Yeah. So we impregnate the 
Kaiton side decide to have a BC ketosan. And, and another another way we pregnant a BC to uh, collagen. And here we try to first put the collagen first, uh, ketosan first, and then uh, with, uh, with collagen. And then what we have here is like this, yeah. We see base one dressing illustrated like this. And then Yeah, this is uh, andaliman. Yeah, uh, actually, we really want to prepare the andaliman in nano herbal, but very unfortunately, uh, we can't. Uh, it's quite difficult for, for us, yeah, to prepare in, in nano uh, meters, in nano size. So we produce just only in micro uh, colloidal. Uh, uh, under lemon, yeah. So hopefully, uh, in the next time we're gonna try to prepare it in nano in nano uh, uh, dimension. Yeah, we put that inside, yeah, and then uh, the under lemon trip very good inside, and then yeah. So we try in uh, FIFO study as well how effective the andaliman uh, to be is like uh, antibacterial, uh, natural antibacterial insides. Yeah. Uh, we got here in the day 16. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we got here is very good uh, with the activity. And then the optimum, again, the optimum uh, number of Andalimans uh, effectively in uh, three grams of andaliman inside. Uh, cellulose as well, we can we can use it for scarf materials. Yeah, like we would do here. So we have already grow the uh, cartilage from deer in it. Yeah, from deer. So uh, we try to use bacterial cellulose as scaffold like this. And then uh, finally, we see how the cartilage uh, grow properly. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, for the next step, we try to, uh, to use the scaffold yeah, to implant to uh, the human body, but it's, it's not now, most probably in the next uh, step. And then we have to work together with uh, our uh, collaborator in uh, medicine. Uh, at the moment, I have students who work to uh, prepare a mask yeah, from uh, bacterial cellulose, and then we Prepay by using uh, electro spinning technology as well, but uh, unfortunately I can't uh, show you the data because uh, the work still ongoing. Yeah. So why uh, we can use the uh, bacterial cellulose for mask? Yeah, to prevent. A droplet and transmitting of uh, COVID-19. Yeah, because uh, we see again very uh, biodegradable materials, non-toxic materials, and very small pores. Even this, the 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 pores actually we we can adjust uh, the small and then easy to produce. Yeah. Uh, even for drug refill as well, some of our uh, students in my groups uh, has already worked, has already prepared the drug refill uh, from bacterial cellulose. Yeah. Again, in the same uh, reason, because 3D fiber structure provide a template for impregnated medicine and non-toxic materials 
biocompatible and then uh, drug release uh, control. This is our member of uh, cellulosic and functional materials in a research center in Universitas Sumatera Utara. Yeah, we have uh, six uh, lecturers there, four PhD students, four grade students, eight master students, and some, and the rest is undergraduate students. Yeah. Uh, we have already uh, published some paper reg regarding to uh, the uh, bactericillus, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, investigation into structure and then uh, even the, the, the new one, we have a publication in FIFO study in microbial, uh, andaliman loaded material cellulose as a burn bone dressing here. Uh, yeah, we have some, uh, is it, a related papers as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Thank you very much, Professor Saharman Dia. Very good result of your uh, student, other student, PhD student in uh, Sumatera Utara University. Thank you very much for your sharing, for your result on the uh, um, uh, research on um, biocellulose material. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, teman-teman, bagi yang mau mau menanyakan, boleh menanyakan dalam bahasa Indonesia, baik melalui uh, Zoom ini maupun melalui uh, YouTube channel. Um, karena waktunya ini sudah mendekati, sudah mau maaf, saya tidak bisa, I cannot stop your presentation, maybe more than 20 minutes, because it's very important, and it's very important to deliver to attendee. So that's why that's why I can I, I don't want to stop all your presentation even though there are more than 20, more than 20 minutes. But I do apologize for all of you. Maybe the, the time will be expanding expanding more than 11, 11 o'clock in this morning in this school. So well, the next uh, presentation will be Jafal Patel, about Doctor PhD. He is uh, from um, uh, Waters Company or uh, in. Uh, um, he is very specialist on uh, characterization of the uh, polymer, polymeric material and also in pharmacy as well. He is also with, uh, um, have a PhD on the pharmaceutical area, but he is also very good in the uh, polymer uh, characterization. So, um, Dr. Davel Patal will, will give a, a lecture on Naval analytical tool for polymer characterizations. It will be have a, I think we will have a very very good information it will be delivered from from the water specific for water limited Singapore on about the novel analytical tool for polymer processing. I hope that when this presentation will have strengthened uh, our result so we have a new uh, insight what how, what can we do with polymer what 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 we should analyze so we can have a good information. The uh, tool, the proper tool, and the proper analysis for the destination of uh, for the properties of uh, uh, product that we want to want to make. Doctor Dafa Patel, please. Yeah. Hi. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone, and thank you again for this opportunity to give a talk. So since it was 20 minutes, I was not sure what I wanted to present. So I thought that I would give you an overview of techniques and maybe a bit more detail of two techniques and some example to see how these technologies are used. So uh, earlier in the morning, uh, we all uh, discussed the increasing role of the polymer R&D. So the challenges that I have summarized on, on these slides here uh, basically uh, relates to the developments that we have seen in polymer R&D today. So with rise of high performance polymer research, uh, biotechnology, and more green chemistry routes to uh, analyze your, your polymers. So let's say if we talk about green chemistry, uh, we are looking at decreasing the use of organic solvents uh, for the green chemistry 
we need to start thinking about how to decrease the use of organic solvents, how to accommodate uh, aqueous matter, particularly for biodegradable polymers. And a lot of these molecular uh, polymers are also low molecular weight polymers. So then it also presents a challenge when it comes to analyzing them. And in terms of uh, modern chemistry, this more relates to uh, synthetic polymers. You really want to have uh, accurate control over reaction conditions so that you want to have a base possible products. So in order to do so, you need uh, a very good information on molecular weight distribution and polydispersity index. So if I look at the complexity, you might have used one of the other techniques. So this is a, a really a snapshot of the techniques that have been, uh, that are used today across a, a different platform. So right from uh, size exclusion chromatography, IR, NMR, mass spec, all the way to thermal and rheology. So thermal and rheology, they are more towards uh, a material property characterization, I would say, uh, mechanical and physical properties. When it comes to analytical techniques, we are referring to mole, their chemical structure and, and the chemical properties. So uh, uh, a quick introduction about the company that I work for, the water. So I'm not sure uh, how many of you know us, but we have uh, several different uh, solutions for material science in general. So what you can see on your uh, left-hand side what we call about separation size and mass spectrometry, where we have solution to characterize uh, a chemical properties of a, of a polymer. And on your right hand side, we have our a TA instrument, which is a subsidiary of waters, where we have solution for thermal analysis, rheology, as well as mechanical testing. But in this talk, I'm going to focus about the chemical uh, properties of a polymeric structure. So in terms of uh, a chemical structure characterization, I have just shown some of the instrument and techniques that we have. Uh, I'm not sure how much knowledge the attendees would have, but I will not be going into uh, details of everything. What I will do, I will focus on, uh, let me turn on the, the pointer. Uh, okay, so I will be talking about this molecular weight distribution and a very brief introduction about uh, how we can use mass spectrometry and what are the uh, updates that we have currently. So why molecular weight and molecular weight distribution is, is important because uh, these are the ones which defines the characteristic properties or end usability of your polymeric molecule. So if you look at the molecular weight to increase the strength, you can have increase in molecular weight, but you decrease a distribution. So as you can see, see here, but what it does lead to, it makes your polymer more brittle. If you want to increase the, uh, the flexibility of your molecule, you increase the distribution of low molecular weight here. Uh, it would work like your internal plasticizer. If you want to increase the, the toughness of your uh, polymer, you can have increase in distribution in general on both sides, lower end and higher side. So this is what I'm trying to convey that by tweaking the molecular weight, you get different properties. So that's why it's very important to understand molecular weight and molecular weight distribution to predict the end use property for your polymers and its functionalities. So a uh, big uh, history relation on polymer chromatography. So if you are not aware, actually the waters in back in 1960s, we collaborated with uh, Dog Chemicals Company and we come out with this first uh, chromatographic techniques for polymer. Uh, we call it as uh, a gel permeation chromatography or in, in GPC in, in other words. And since then we have done uh, a lot of development from there. So one of the key scientists who was involved from Dow is uh, John Morey. He, he approached uh, Jim Waters, who was a founder uh, of Waters to come up with the solution that they have uh, challenges in their polymer analysis in their, their company. And this process involved passing their polymers through a resin column. So I think this is probably one of the first chromatograph you might see for polymer. Uh, and as part of this, uh, development, we come out with this commercial product, what we call as a gel permeation chromatography. 
So a quick introduction, uh, how does a gel permission chromatography or GPC work? The another terminology for gel permission chromatography is also size diffusion chromatography or SEC. Uh, to make some differentiation, when we talk about GPC, we are referring to a material or polymer. When we talk about size diffusion chromatography, it is particularly used more commonly for proteins and, and peptide and those kind of uh, uh, molecules. Okay, so in GPC, a polymer uh, dissolved in appropriate solvent. Okay, it is then injected through a, a GPC column, which consists of a porous gel based stationary phase. And the pores of this stationary phase can be either same or, or mixture of different pore size. And you can see that in the picture, uh, the small uh, size of the polymer can easily enter into the poles, whereas the bigger size uh, polymer or the portion will enter less or not enter at all into the pores. Okay. And one thing I would like to point out here that in this kind of separation mechanism, uh, we are only looking at thermodynamic standpoint. There is no chemistry involved. So that means there is no interaction of your polymer molecules with the stationary phase uh, in this case. Okay. And what happens? We get uh, a macromolecule elution by their decreasing size order. So one of the easiest way to, to remember uh, this, this elution order is what we call as Bokov, which basically big ones comes out first. And you can see here in this chromatogram of abundance versus elution volume, which is defined by retention time, we have a largest a polymeric material or polymer coming out first and the smallest elution out later, okay? And this would give you a lot of information uh, based on their size in solution. So one thing is that you might have two polymers having a similar molecular weight, but they might behave differently in GPC. The reason being because when we dissolve in a solution, their hydrodynamic volume could be different, although they have the same molecular weight. So this is a key uh, concept that you should keep in the mind. And there are uh, a number of calculations. So let's say what we end up after all fractions are eluted from the column is, is a profile or distribution of molecular weight here. And important physical property as well as processing parameters can be gleaned from this shape of this particular distribution, okay? So the, the equation that are shown here is shows how the average molecular weights are defined. It helps in understanding why there are few molecular weight around and why do we have this different terminology such as MN, MP, uh, and polydispersity and, and so on. The polymer uh, made by a species of a varying length, okay? So each length is that characterized by its molecular weight here, okay? Uh, let's say if we put it that Mi and its abundance as Ni. Then by using this calculation, we can get different uh, a formula, which I'm not going into a detail, but wh why we are concerned about this different parameters, as you can see here, for example, the number average would give you the indication of uh, brittleness of your polymer and also like compressibility of your polymer. If you look at the, the weight average, it refers to a strength on, of your polymer and it also impacts the resistance that you might want to get it. And if you look at the polydispersity index, which is the ratio of uh, a weight average by a number average is very much uh, important to study a property of polymer, okay? And the ability of this gel permission chromatography is that in a single analysis, you can get all this information, which you can't really get from by using a number of techniques that I will show you uh, later in a snapshot. Okay. So let's say if you look at NMR, it's only measures the number average. If you look at the mass spectrometry, it measures the number average and weight average. The light scattering technique, it measures the weight average. The osmolarity, it measures the, uh, the number average. Although this technique gives you, uh, I would say more accurate measurement of mass, but none of them would give you a distribution of molecular weight. So the size acquisition chromatography or GPC is the only technique which gives you uh, a distribution. And that's why it is so unique and commonly used uh, in polymer structure characterization. Uh, 
So this is a, a product that we have. Again, I'm not going into a detail about what we have in the product, but when you want to look at a GPC analysis, you want to make sure that the system that you are using, it is compatible with wide variety of solvents because with polymer, you might have to use very different uh, range of solvents. You have to ensure that it is compatible with number of detector. Later, I will show you uh, on one slide why we need to use a combination of different detectors here, because these detectors would give you a, a different information. And sometimes you need to use more than one detector to get a comprehensive information. However, although GPC has been used for decades, at least let's say since 1960 until now, over uh, 50 years of development, there are some inherent challenges or I would say pain point of this analysis. So one of them is, of course, the analysis time it takes. So I'm not talking about the chromatographic run time, but also from sample prep to a result generation, okay? The another one is use of gel-based column. So if you ever run a, a GPC, you know that these columns are very much fragile because they are made up of styrene or, or methacrylate kind of material. If you want to change solvent to another solvent, it's not that easy. You need to wait for hours or, or day, and you have to keep a different set of columns for different solvents. And as I mentioned earlier, these days, because of advancement, we are looking at low molecular weight and oligomers and, and biopolymers, where the resolution offered by GPC sometimes is not really enough to do the analysis that you want to do it. So how we can uh, overcome these challenges or what are the advances that we have in a GPC? So again, uh, along with Dow Chemicals uh, about uh, six years ago now, we come out with what we call as advanced polymer chromatography. So this is uh, in a way when we move from HPLC to ultra performance liquid chromatography. So likewise from GPC, we, move, we have moved to what we call as advanced polymer chromatography. So what it is, this is a technique where we have very low dispersion of everything in a system. We use a, a, a novel chemistry if in terms of stationary phase, which, with these, which has very small particle size, okay? And they are specifically designed to, to, re, to be rigid and withstand a lot of different solvents that you need to use. So basically we wanted to overcome the challenges that you face with a traditional a GPC technique. For example, you can use one column bank for multiple analysis. You don't have to use multiple column bank for different solvents. You don't need to wait a very long for equilibration time. You can get on to the system very fast. It really allows web rapid method development. And likewise, we can also couple to a number of uh, advanced detectors that we have. So just to give you an uh, example, so again, this is a data from Doc Chemicals. You can see they were analyzing this polystyrene mix of H standard. Uh, although by using the base GPC techniques, that time it was not possible to resolve those eight uh, polystyrene standards. But with uh, advanced polymer chromatography, we can separate them very well in, in less than three minutes and all of them are separated from each other. So this is uh, what is the power of uh, advanced polymer chromatography it, it offers. Uh, why we can get this thing, the two main characteristics is of course the the column or stationary phase we use, we use very uh, sub-micron particle size, which gives us uh, increased resolution in terms of separation. We use very low dispersion system. That means the tubing that we use for column and from injection to detector, all this column, all those tubings has very little volume so that you don't compromise your separation after your column. And this has been particularly suitable for oligomers, additives, and residuals. So for GPC, if you want to analyze your polymer plus additives, so these are like those small molecular weight compounds which are used to enhance the functionality of your polymers, you can't really do that in one analysis. However, with APC, you can analyze both your polymer as well as your additive in, in a single analysis, okay? So let's look at some uh, relevant examples. So, in this case, I have example of uh, polyurethane standards, which is basically a mixture of a number of polysaccharides. So you can see here 
there are about uh, eight to 10 polysaccharides mixed and we can separate all the standards within a four minutes runtime. And you can really see that uh, the separation is quite, quite good enough by dissolving this particular sample in water. Why I'm going uh, talking about this particular example, because when we talk about uh, GPC or size exclusion analysis, you need to use suitable calibration standard to match your polymer type. So I'm going to show you one quick example of lignin analysis. So we, we can use this kind of polysaccharide standard to calibrate our lignin analysis. So this particular uh, study, actually we, we earlier this year, we have a, a full webinar where uh, Prof. Andre Pothost from uh, Vienna, Australia, she presented uh, uh, the challenges with lignin and how we can overcome. So I just shown one example Let's say if you want to determine the molecular weight of lignin, there are various approaches. For example, one of them, you can derivatize and then dissolve it into an organic solvent, typically by acetylation or acetobromination. However, this uh, requires you to do additional step of derivatization. There are some approaches to do a direct dissolution in organic solvent uh, with or without salt. Uh, here, you don't really need any, any derivatization. However, it may or may not work for most solvents. And another approach is using an uh, aqueous solvent. Okay? So one of the approach they use in their uh, lab is they do underivatized lignin by dissolving in the combination of DMSO and lithium bromide. Okay? So what they were able to do by combination of three or four columns in a rank, as you can see here, they were able to achieve a very good separation of low molecular weight species or all the samples in a single run. So why I'm showing this diagram? Because originally they were running what we call as a 65 minutes run time in, in their GPC method. When they moved to advanced polymer chromatography, they realized that this technique is not only fast, uh, but it gives them a better separation so that they can able to see more characteristic features of polymer which they were not able to see before. Uh, a very quick slide on the detector, as, as I mentioned. So over the years, we also have uh, advances in detector. So one of the common detector that was used is RI or refractive index detector, which gives you a, a precise measurement of molecular weight distribution, but is not an accurate technique. But most of the time, the polymer chemists, they want to look at the distribution, okay? Then we have viscometry, which typically gives you information about structural information such as branching in your polymer. Then uh, we now have uh, companies who would offer you what we call a triple detection or combination of light scattering, viscometry, and UV and RI detector, all detector in one. So this can help you to predict polymer behavior as well as structural information in a single analysis. And why we are talking about different uh, detectors, so you have to keep in mind different techniques gives you different information. So if you want to get accurate molecular weight, of course, the light distribution would give you uh, a more accurate information. However, it's not a precise measurement of polydispersity index. So conventional uh, techniques such as uh, refractive index detector would give you more precise measurement of polydispersity index versus the light scattering or other detector. So that's why the choice of detector would depend on your ultimate objective of analysis. Uh, we have done a lot of uh, studies, so I may not be going into a particular example, but again here by using APC, we can uh, evaluate the degradation of drug delivery polymers that are used for certain drug formulation. And as mentioned by earlier speaker that these days we are talking about bioplastic, which is polylactic acid. And that analysis is also quite complicated. By using this technique, we can also analyze it with much more easier, okay? Although with interest of time, I did not go into a detail, but there are also some uh, advanced technique, okay? So one of them I mentioned here, the APC with triple detection, where we combine, combine multiple detector, we also have what we call a two-dimensional uh, advanced polymer chromatographic separation where you want to analyze your complex sample. So which technique you will use, again, would depend on your uh, goal of your analysis. So let's say if you want to do a routine analysis 
want to follow a standard method, you can use with standard GPC method. If you want to go for more superior performance, that means you want to uh, have a system which allows you to look at low molecular weight polymers or oligomers, then you should start to look at uh, something like advanced polymer chromatographic system. And then so on, as you increase your uh, complexity of your sample, you can go across this uh, different detection technique by using combination of techniques or going to uh, advanced separation such as two dimensional. But again, I'm not uh, going into detail. If you are interested to know more, uh, you can contact us. We'll share this material later, and then you will have more, more understanding as well. I was told to give some information about uh, quick tips and tricks. So if you are using a GPC or SCC, I will give you some uh, information that could be helpful for your method development and troubleshooting. So of course, one of the, the challenges that people would often face is sample preparation and concentration. So as you can see the table here, depending on your molecular weight of your polymer, you might need a different uh, time to dissolve your sample, okay? So bear in mind that polymers are not like that. You put in the solvent, you can quickly dissolve and get on to run with sample. And in terms of the sample concentration, so depending on your molecular weight and what kind of column you are using, you can use different volume of injection of your sample, okay? And for uh, the molecular weight distribution, as I mentioned, if your molecular weight is really very big, let's say more than a, a million Dalton, then uh, you need to wait for at least one or two days to let it completely dissolve. One caution, you should not sonicate or vertex your, your sample uh, to dissolve it because if you sonicate it, uh, it might uh, lead to degradation and molecular weight distribution of your polymeric sample may not be representative of original sample. So we don't really recommend to sonication, to use sonication or, or word texting of your sample. You can do very gentle agitation or let it sit for a long time to dissolve your sample. Again, I'm not going into a detail, but we have this guide, which uh, I think you, I will share with you, all of you later. So uh, depending on your molecular weight, you can just refer to uh, the available information, which column or stationary phase that you should select. And, and likewise, also for the mobile phase, so uh, mobile phase selection would also depend on your polymer type, whether it's a neutral polymer, hydrophobic or amphoteric, uh, polymer and depending on your polymer, you can choose an appropriate uh, mobile phase to to dissolve your 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 particular sample. Since the RI detector is one of the commonly used detector, uh, one of the common problem that I get from uh, many of our customers that you know they have problem of baseline. So for RI detector, one of the way you can do it, you have to wait for your detector to be get stabilized. So this is how the uh, not stabilized diagram or the chromatographic run would look like. When it is stabilized, you can see that the performance your separation is much more better. Okay, so you have to give it enough time for RI detector to stabilize. What about your solvent? So we would recommend to avoid topping off and recycling your mobile phase because with RI detector, you get this concentration effect. So this is uh, your original chromatogram. And after five days, if you just keep on adding the solvent, you will get increase in concentration, which is not a true representation of your sample. Okay, so bear in mind about this uh, sample concentration effect. Sometimes it's also important to, to match your diluent. Okay, so let's say if you use old uh, THF and you make a sample with a fresh THF, obviously you would get this difference in your chromatographic separation. So to avoid this kind of phenomena, what we recommend is that you can use your sample diluent as your mobile phase. So whatever mobile phase you use it to run this kind of chromatography, you use it to dissolve your sample, okay? Another uh, common challenge is the Peak shape, so I'm not sure how often you do this analysis, but quite often people will compare about this uh, distorted peak shape. So let's say if you are 
uh, talking about highest molecular standards is degrade significantly with larger injection volumes okay and when the concentration is high so if you as you can see if you decrease the the concentration of your a polymer sample you can see you can get rid of this uh, peak shape problem okay how about uh, a concentration is decreased when you inject a larger injection volume so sometimes you also have to bear in mind uh, the appropriate injection volume so as you can see as you increase the injection volume your peaks are getting a, a broader and broader okay so this is what uh, matters so very quickly uh, again uh, to give you a quick example of mass spec although i did not discuss in 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 detail but you are familiar that ir and nmr are also used as a spectroscopic technique these techniques do provide uh, overall average features of molecular system but they does not provide an individual molecular structure so when people want to see it uh, the individual molecular structure of your molecule how they are arranged what are the chemical uh, monomeric units you need to go for mass spectrometry and it is increasingly used technique for analysis of oligomers by either using uh, electrospray ionization or, or maldi however even with mass spec if you are dealing with uh, a complex oligomers which might have different structure but they have similar molecular weight then you can't really differentiate very well so over the last few years there have been uh, enhancement in a uh, mass spectrometry as well so to give you indication this is how so let's say if you have a google map we like this google map because uh, it gives you a great job in getting into your right neighborhood okay but when you add what we call a street view on top of this google map you not only get into right neighborhood you can even find the right building okay so this is how uh, the advancements help it so what we have done for the mass spectrometry we have combined what we call as ion mobility so when you have a ion mobility separation on top of your mass spectrometry we get this high definition mass spectrometry okay so what why it is important because it can help you to separate isomers conformers and give you information about polymer shape and folding pattern okay by using this particular technique so again with interest of time i'm not going into the basics of this technique how it works i will just give you the example how it looks like so the ion mobility data basically locates the three dimensional conformation of your molecule let's say when we ionize molecule in a gaseous phase some molecule would be more complex structure the other could be more uh, open or or a linear structure or a branch structure right so let's see uh, the more complex structure would come out first then the branch and then more open structure will come out later so this is similar to uh, the analysis but in this case is reverse the complex molecule come out first and bigger molecule come out later in gpc your bigger molecule would come out first then your smaller molecule okay so one of the application is to really analyze the the polymer mixture okay so sorry <clears throat> so in this case uh, i have a mixture of this peg and ppg two different polymer so if you mix them together is very difficult to separate this polymeric mixture by any other technique but when you run this with the ion mobility mass spectrometry this data represent this is the molecular weight of your polymer and here is a drip time or the time when it comes out from ion mobility so by looking at this distinct pattern we can differentiate this uh, peg and ppg kind of molecular how what polymer shape and folding pattern we can also characterize this by using a mass spectrometry with ion mobility so to give you an example of a, a block copolymer and a random copolymer okay so again if you have mixture of these two in a blend is very difficult to analyze uh, whether is a block copolymer or random copolymer but when we look at this data by doing the ion mobility mass spec analysis we can see that they give you a different uh, a pattern okay so the here the monomeric units are same the repeat monomeric unit are, are are not same they are random okay and here we can see this different pattern okay 
So by using uh, this kind of analysis, we can quickly differentiate whether it's a, a random copolymer, okay, or, or a block copolymer. Again, we have a lot of examples. So uh, sorry, I, I, since we're going to share these slides, I will not go into a detail, but you can refer to some of the publication for, for more, more detail. So in, in summary, the polymers have inherent population of chain length. So we are always dealing with a statistical population rather than individual, individual chain length. And knowing molecular weight of polymer is very critical to understand its bulk property. A GPC or SCC is one of the common use method for identifying and studying the molecular weight distribution. Uh, over the last uh, few years, uh, advancement in GPC has led to this technique called advanced polymer chromatography, which not only provides you increased resolution, but also gives you a speed and flexibility in terms of the molecules that you can analyze. Although I give you a very quick uh, snapshot of advanced mass spectrometry, but the, now we have a technique which can give you a separation capability to go beyond uh, your simple molecules to really look at complex oligomers where you have a lot of isobaric polymer structure within the same molecule. So uh, thank you for your time and attendance and I'll be happy to answer any question later during the, the Q&A session. And I have uh, my email address here as well as you can scan this QR code if you want to get particular uh, information or, or this presentation, please uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much for Dr. Jaffa Patel for delivering the uh, information about the new technology for polymer characterization, especially for molecular weight distribution and molecular weight uh, type of uh, morphologies. So we are going to a uh, question and answer session. And we are very thanks to Professor uh, for Dr. Um, Pati Anna, uh, Kumar Anamalai, because he, he has to leave this meeting uh, for Pigaf, he has an, another meeting. Apologize for us for the extending this, uh, this webinar. Um, and again, thank you very much for uh, Dr. Uh, Pati. Now we are going to have some, um, a um, question and association. Before we, sebelum kita mulai, kita adakan dulu uh, pengumuman dulu mengenai uh, para teman-teman diharapkan untuk segera mengisi. Uh, sebentar. Ya, untuk mengisi kehadirannya di BitLY, nah alamatnya di sini, dan juga untuk melihat evaluasi dari uh, BitLY-nya di alamat tersebut. Selanjutnya, kita mulai pada sesi pertanyaan. Uh, sebenarnya ada beberapa pertanyaan untuk uh, Dr. Pratip, tapi mohon maaf karena Dr. Pratipnya Our schedule-nya sangat padat, sehingga harus ada pertemuan meeting dengan uh, ada meeting yang lain. Uh, pertanyaan untuk pertama untuk uh, Dr. Amanda. Ada yang mengatakan Dr. Amanda, ada yang mengatakan Dr. Atta. Saya pikir namanya jadi nama baru. <laughs> uh, pertanyaan pertama itu... Uh, Langsung dua pertanyaan saja ya, karena waktunya sudah ini, sudah cukup uh, molor. Pertanyaannya dari, uh, sudah ada tim yang memilih pertanyaan. Uh, Dr. Atta, in which state of research now has the nanocellulose application of drug... Uh, uh, sebentar, sebentar. Um, oh, sebentar. Dari ini nih, dari pertanyaan dari Nurhana Mardiah. I am Nurhana Diponegoro University undergraduate student, major in chemistry. Uh, I'm going to ask Miss Dr. Atanasia Amanda. I am currently doing research on using phospholipids 
a structure reference system. So I am interested on nanocellulose as structure reference system. Is nanocellulose stable, stable at this structure reference system? Will the will the divider on the drug produced by nanosolus inhibit or not efficient enough to encapsulate and release the active compound? Thanks you for ocean webinar. And the second question for Dr. Amanda is uh, from uh, dari YouTube. Ini dari Ibu Trihandayani. Pertanyaannya. Apakah nanoselulose juga bisa digunakan untuk vaksin delivery? Itu pertanyaannya. Mungkin sudah dipresentasikan tadi ya. Sebenarnya sudah ada konsepnya. Tapi monggo silakan uh, Dr. Amanda untuk menjawabnya. Saya pikir 5 sampai 10 menit ya. Mungkin uh, begitu. Silakan. Oke. Okay. Uh, okay. uh, for the students from University of Diponegoro. Uh, actually, I already <laughs> replied her question in uh, to her that uh, she is not doing the phospholipid as the active agents in the drug delivery. So, as I to the best I have my knowledge that phospholipid is uh, amphiphilic materials that having about hydrophilic and also hydrophobic sites. So. Uh, in the case of that, the phospholipid having a both uh, amphiphilic characters, it means that it is possible to use this phospholipids uh, to be incorporated into the nanocellulose uh, drug delivery systems. Because uh, the hydrophilic side, which is, I think, the phosphate side, can interact well with the nanocellulose surface functionality. Uh, and I also would suggest, as this phospholipid is also uh, having the, the hydrophobic side, so it is possible for you to do the modification in order to provide the hydrophobic function on the nanocellulose backbone. And then you can get the excellence cross-linking interaction. So you can find a, a lots of the uh, publication in the modification of the uh, hydrophobic uh, modification on the nanocellulose uh, backbone side that you can uh, try to use. And also, if you have uh, some <laughs> further question about this modification in hydrophobic uh, modification in the nanocellulose side, you also can uh, send me uh, an email. So the second question, karena dalam bahasa Indonesia pertanyaannya ya, kan saya oh, jawab dengan bahasa Indonesia tadi. <laughs> Silakan. <laughs> Jawabnya bahasa Indonesia juga boleh semuanya. <laughs> Pertanyaan tadi gimana Pak? Lupa Pak. Eh, Tahu <laughs> ya. Saya saya otak boleh menang ini. Uh, pertanyaan untuk yang uh, yang kedua itu dari dari siapa ya? untuk dari Tri Ibu Tri Handayani. Apakah nanoselulos juga bisa digunakan untuk vaksin delivery? Jika bisa, oh, sorry. Ya. oh ya, vaksin delivery ya. ya uh, sebenarnya untuk vaksin delivery belum ki pernah kita coba ya. Tapi sebagai proof of konsepnya uh, dalam sebuah uh, sistem vaksin uh, dispersi itu sangat penting sekali. Dispersi vaksin agent in the uh, itu uh, dalam sistem vaksin itu sangat penting. Nah, beberapa report juga menunjukkan bahwa nanosellulos itu sangat bagus dalam memberi kestabilan dalam sebuah dispersi solusi solution untuk mendeliver beberapa active agent yang bisa dipakai untuk vaksin. Jadi, untuk karena kalau dia akan misalkan dia tidak mempunyai dispersi yang bagus maka dia kurang optimum dalam uh, memberikan manfaat vaksin tersebut di dalam tubuh kita. Nah, penggunaan nanosolosa bisa dipakai juga sebagai uh, helping in dispersion agent dalam vaksin sistem. Nah, uh, terutama kalau untuk dispersi ini, lebih baik saya sarankan ini dalam bentuk selosono kristal. Karena selosono kristal ini uh, morfologinya sangat, uh, sangat kecil sekali, diameternya 
lima kurang dari 10 nanometer, kemudian lengnya juga di bawah 100 nanometer, itu sangat bagus sekali untuk membantu uh, memberikan suatu manfaat dalam memberikan dispersi yang baik dalam suatu solution terutama dalam vaksin sistem. Itu Pak yang mungkin bisa saya, saya sampaikan. Baik, terima kasih Ibu Dr. Amanda. Kita pertanyaan selanjutnya untuk eh saya udah anu video dong. Pertanyaan selanjutnya untuk Profesor Saharman Gia. Uh, saya carikan dulu ada dua pertanyaan juga, satu dari Ibu Ana. Uh, let's say for mass application. What is the necessity of using nanocellulose rather than just using microcellulose as each material? Because it will take more time to prepare the nanocellulose itself. Itu pertanyaan yang pertama. Ya. Langsung aja ya, yang kedua ya, biar nanti langsung dijawab. Mungkin karena ke waktunya sudah mau jam 12 nih. Ini Uki Lukitowati, pertanyaan untuk Profesor Saharman Gea. Implan bioselulus pada tikus yang telah dilakukan pada bagian apa? Apakah melakukan dilat apakah dilakukan defek terlebih dahulu dan bagaimana responnya? Berapa lama waktu inflamasi yang terjadi dan apakah BC biocellulose dapat direshop oleh hewan? Berapa lama waktunya? Banyak sekali pertanyaannya. Silakan uh, Prof. Harman Gia 5 sampai 10 menit ya, Prof. Harman ya. <laughs> Pertanyaan saya singkat-singkat aja Pak Suni. Saya sedang S3 ini. Jadi, uh, ya, kenapa ya harus dalam bentuk nano? Ya karena virus sendiri itu adalah uh, ukurannya nano, lebih kecil lagi dibanding bakteri. Jadi kalau bukan dalam bentuk nano atau dalam bentuk, uh, katakanlah dalam mikro, maka nanti akan lolos. Makanya dia kita buat dalam bentuk nano. Uh, seperti yang kami sampaikan tadi, uh, kami juga sedang membuat uh, nano seperti nano mask lah, nano mask. Tapi belum bisa kami uh, apa, kami tunjukkan karena lagi berlangsung mahasiswa S2 saya kebetulan yang mengerjakan itu. Uh, jadi itu saja sebetulnya karena kita menyesuaikan uh, ukurannya. Seterusnya yang tadi uh, sebetulnya Pak Sunit. Uh, saya sudah menjawab ini beberapa pertanyaan tadi, tapi mungkin saya ketiklah jawabannya tadi. E, itu e, apa namanya? Memang itu dilakukan e, dengan luka bakar derajat 4. Ya, jadi kawan-kawan yang biasa diimplan mengerti itu ya. E, terus andalimannya juga kami buat masih dalam bentuk ekstrak, belum kami refine, belum e, kami pisahkan komponen aktifnya. Nah, itu yang saya sampaikan tadi juga bahwa idealnya itu kita buat dalam uh, nano uh, dimensi nano nanometer tapi kami di usuh belum bisa belum bisa membuat itu uh, mungkin perlulah alat atau perlu metode yang lain yang kami kembangkan mungkin nanti uh, kami akan kerjasama belajar dari Ibu Amanda bagaimana membuatnya gitu ya karena akan lebih bagus kalau ukurannya nano Bu Amanda tertrack oh, ya. tertrack ter dengan baik gitu loh tapi uh, oh, ya. Kami mengakuilah belum 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 bisa. Belum bisa. Ya kami buat itu masih uh, mikro uh, koloidal uh, andaliman. Ah. Ya. Uh, seterusnya apa tadi uh, dua ya, cuma dua ya. Ya terus uh, penutupan tertutup itu pada hari 8 ke 18 tertutup 100 persen dan itu pada penambahan 3 gram pada penambahan di atas itu 5 gram malah dia enggak enggak bagus ya nah, terlalu kering saya lihat di situ punggung dari tikus yang kita lukai itu terlalu kering ya bahkan cenderung enggak bagus lah yang efektif tiga kenapa tiga ya sedang kami lihat juga kenapa itu tiga kawan-kawan juga kami tanya di biologi kenapa ya justru di sana nah, jadi itu barangkali pak ya Sekian, Pak. Sudah ya? <laughs> suka suka <laughs> saja, Pak. <laughs> Mohon maaf, saya tadi harus ke belakang dulu. Um, yeah. Next question is from 
uh, for Dr. Dafal Pratip. Uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Dafal Patel from the uh, Waters. I, I I have one question for you, and the other question is from Laude. Laude is asking for what is another uh, uh, GPC standard rather than other than a uh, pollutant. Yeah. This is the first question, and okay. the second question is from me. Um, actually, what is the challenging for uh, measuring the molecular weight of um, a cellulose itself? So, um, because there are a lot of a uh, 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 side group, in, it will be very challenging for uh, measuring the molecular weight and especially also the second one is what is the challenging for molecular uh, molecular weight distribution for a uh, molecule polymer having the uh, branching polymer yeah this is uh, second two questions please dr Jaffa Patel. okay so <laughs> for the the first question right uh, the choice of stand, the calibration standard would uh, depend on the polymer that you analyze. So although I showed that example of uh, polylin because it was used for lignin studies, but we have actually, I answered that question in the chat box and shared a link. So we have a, a number of what we call as a, a narrow standards and a broad standard. So a narrow standard, that means they have the poly dispersity index of nearly one or closer to one. And these are quite commonly used to do a calibration for GPC. So we have, uh, I think, at least 10 or 20 different uh, polymer standards. So a polystyrene, whether you are using aqueous polymer, you are using organic solvent. So uh, I have the list. So it's there. OK, I may not go to the list, but we have the number of styrene. For the second question, so Again, uh, I don't have personal experience in analyzing the, the complex cellulose molecule that you mentioned. What we have done, we have used the, the hemicellulose, which is actually a semi-synthetic derivative, uh, derivative of uh, cellulose. So the, in terms of molecular uh, weight distribution and branching, so for a branching, you have to use, uh, I would say, a viscometer or something what I call a triple detection you won't able to get uh, that information if you do GPC with RI detector, okay? So the challenge would be to use uh, appropriate uh, a detector, then it leads to a calculation. But these days, uh, the suppliers, they would have uh, a software, you know, designed for you to some guide tool to how to interpret that branching information. So then you calculate the, uh, I think, viscosity a parameter, and now we know a different range, okay? So we can gauge by different range, uh, what could be the type of the structure. So I would say you might need to use other techniques in, in addition to a GPC to get a uh, very accurate information for the branching by simply using uh, a GPC, you will not able to get a very accurate information. So you might have to go for IR as well as NMR to complement that. In terms of uh, a challenge, I would say, it, it would rely on whether you can uh, find uh, appropriate solvent to dissolve your sample, whether you are able to, to separate it very well. So sometimes people may use two or three column or sometimes a four column. So it would really depend on how you are going to perform the experiment. So maybe uh, there is limit to what you can do with traditional uh, GPC separation. You might have to look for some advanced separation techniques such as you know the APC that I described. If you are really dealing with low molecular weight uh, kind of uh, distribution in your cellulose sample. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah there was one more question on the live chat. If I can, I may answer. Someone asked the, the shortcoming or limitation of uh, HDMS, the mass spectrometry system that I described. Okay. So, I would answer is uh, it might be relevant to other technique. Let's say if you have some insoluble material, okay? You cannot dissolve in any solvent. If you cannot dissolve in any solvent, you cannot do GPC. You cannot do even mass spectrometry. So the 
the HDMS technology that I've described is also we are injecting uh, a solution into a sample or sometimes we, we use like a probe where we just dip into uh, a material and directly put into the mass chromatogram. But then there is this new technique called pyrolysis. So I'm not sure whether it's familiar. So pyrolysis is a, a combustion process in absence of oxygen. So you can just cut a small piece of material, put into a furnace, then it would convert it into a, a vapor or gaseous form. Then you can use a gas chromatography to analyze, even though your material is insoluble and you cannot find any solvent to dissolve it. So these are some of the other techniques that they can use it. Apart from the cost of the instrument, these HDMS mass spectrometry instruments are uh, quite expensive. So if you talk about the shortcomings in, in terms of the technique as such. Thank you very much for Dr. Tafal Patel for the nice information. So because of the time, we have to finish our session. Um, please apologize for the next session we will have in Indonesia for uh, announcement session. Is this okay, Dr. Tafal? I, I will give the note in, in the, um, Bahasa Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, untuk rekan-rekan semuanya jangan lupa untuk mengisi apa namanya untuk mengisi uh, untuk mengisi uh, Ini yang yang ter, ini yang mana ya? Ini ya yang ter ini ya. Betul apakah ini yang ter ini? Ya, yang sharing yang ini ya. Halo, apa bisa cek? Ya, untuk mengisi kehadiran teman-teman semua untuk mengisi kehadiran di sini uh, uh, di kemudian untuk evaluasi di alamat ini. Kemudian kami ucapkan terima kasih pada. PT Krom Tekido Utama dan Waters atas sponsornya di dalam acara ini memberikan dukungan berupa material maupun hal-hal lain yang untuk material materi berupa hal-hal lain yang juga disupport di dalam acara ini di mana kami juga memerlukan informasi informasi terbaru di dalam uh, uh, me, apa namanya dalam membantu untuk memberikan informasi mengenai teknologi terbaru dalam analisa dari polimer. Kemudian ke, uh, selanjutnya adalah mengenai pemenang dari door prize sudah dipilih oleh tim dan door prize ini dipersembahkan oleh PT Chrome Tech Indo Utama sebagai salah satu detail, apa namanya prinsipal dari uh, Waters dan TI Instrument di Indonesia dan ini uh, para pemenang nanti diharapkan untuk memberikan alamat email ke panitia dan nanti panitia akan memberikan email tersebut ke PT Krom Tekido dan uh, uh, door prize nya langsung diberikan oleh uh, PT Krom Tekido setelah mungkin insya Allah akan melalui email dan pemenangnya adalah satu itu Mbak Nur Hana Martia dua Mas Ruri dan yang ketiga Laude Rahman Ramadan sudah dengar semuanya ya halo eh dengar kan <laughs> terima kasih kepada pemenangnya dan terima kasih kepada semuanya. Jangan lupa untuk memberikan evaluasi mengenai mengenai materi akan diberikan melalui email yang Bapak Ibu akan diberikan link melalui email yang Bapak Ibu isi di daftar kehadiran. Termasuk juga nanti sertifikat akan diberikan link untuk upload melalui Google Drive dan link itu akan diberikan melalui email yang Bapak Ibu sampaikan melalui daftar kehadiran. Baik yang hadir di dalam Zoom maupun hadir di dalam 
di dalam uh, melalui YouTube. Ini hadir sekitar 240 50-an peserta dan dari Zoom dan ada sekitar sekitar 90 peserta dari YouTube streaming. Terima kasih atas semuanya dan semoga hal ini bermanfaat dari kami dari Pusat Penelitian Kimia LIPI, Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia mengucapkan terima kasih kepada hadirin semuanya. Terima kasih kepada Profesor Saharman G atas kesediaannya untuk memberikan materi kepada Dr. Atanasia Amanda Septofani, PhD yang telah memberikan materinya. Beliau juga Mbak Amanda ini juga dari Pusat Kimia juga. And also thanks very much for Dr. Jafal Patil for your presentation, very nice presentation for new technology and uh, polymer characterization, and also your supporting for, for this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Terima kasih semuanya. Silahkan bisa off masing-masing. Jangan lupa mengisi evaluasi. Dan mohon maaf untuk yang panelis bisa berbicara sebentar di ruang panggis. Thank you very much for all talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. Assalamualaikum. Thank you. Pak Sarman boleh ngomong-ngomong sebentar tuh kalau bisa. Silakan, silakan. Uh, Dr. Fatel, you, you may live for for this uh, for this uh, meeting. Yes. Okay. You may... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I prepare my.